Hello, um, welcome to this presentation. Um, my name is Christian Bloch and I hope you liked what you just saw. Uh, as a matter of fact, I hope you saw the movie Trollbridge. Um, I'm the visual effects supervisor and co-producer, coincidentally, of this little film. Um, and yeah, today I'm gonna talk about, uh, talk, give you a little bit of a look behind the scenes uh, and um, it was, let me just dive right in. If you don't know about Terry Pratchett, this is the author of this story. Um, and he is a man who captured my imagination at a young age. Oops, my chair is in the way. So, um, I've been a lifetime fan of his work. Uh, he is a um, British fantasy author a humorist, a philosopher, even though he would never admit it. Uh, he's often compared to Douglas Adams here in the US. He's most known for his cooperation with Neil Gaiman. Uh, Good Omens was a, is a show that just came out on Netflix. Uh, really amazing show, highly recommend. It's about the apocalypse. Terry died at the age of 66. Sadly, midst of our production, um, he should be more known in America. He is, he sold 85 million books. So I don't know why that doesn't make you an instant celebrity. He lived his life the way he wrote his books. Um, and he wrote 41 novels. That's what he left us with. Uh, these are all, it's, it's a huge body of work. Uh, they're all sort of connected with each other, uh, kind of like the extended universe of Marvel, almost. There are multiple storylines, uh, several books follow several characters and they cross every once in a while. And our story actually comes from, our film is the cinematic adaptation of a short story. Um, and it sits in this entire universe right here. So. It's kind of halfway of the character arc of Cohen the Barbarian. And one of his iconic characters uh, that Terry created, Paul Gidby fleshed out and kind of visualized, was Cohen the Barbarian, here seen with his gray horde of all the other retired heroes or 
shall I say, never actually retired. Because uh, that's the thing. When you're undefeated, then you just you just grow old. Um, and our Cohen is Don Bridges. <laughs> um, in real life, he doesn't look like that at all. That's actually him. Uh, so a lot of makeup went into turning him into Cohen. Um, way in the way, I realize. And yeah, it turns out he is exactly the Cohen that you'd know from the books. So bang on. <laughs> yeah, another Terry Pratchett quote. We just had no idea <laughs> how hard it would be to get that thing on screen. Um, the clip you just saw, that was my director, Daniel Knight, in 2011 uh, when we did the Kickstarter pitch. And that actually was one of the most successful Kickstarter pitches at that time. In fact, the most successful, the biggest movie funding that ever happened then. And we raised about $80,000. Outside of Kickstarter, we raised a little bit extra. So I think in total we had 145,000, which sounds like a lot of money for a normal person, but any filmmaker will laugh at you and say, what, you want to make one shot in Game of Thrones? Because <laughs> uh, that's about the budgetary situation we are talking about grand CG. Um, but the thing is, we still want to do it, so had to use the money wisely. Uh, they ended up spending a lot of it, actually, uh, on New Zealand. Uh, the thing is, everybody was still a volunteer. The only way how we could get the whole thing done was by everybody volunteering, the DP volunteering, all the, uh, uh, pretty much everybody across the board. Um, and they ended up shooting a lot of phenomenal footage. This one I don't need to play with. You can find all these trailers online as well on our website. The one problem was that you cannot actually get a horse into a helicopter. So a lot of these uh, scenes in New Zealand are as epic as they are. They just have no horse in them. So it ended up needing a CG horse for a whole lot of them. Yeah, that's the New Zealand footage. The other problem was that originally we got involved with that movie in 2005. So the, the Mike at all that you saw there, that was kind of like the first iteration, uh, which is pretty much just as bad as even the footage. So by that time, we realized that we have to reshoot Good everything. Okay. Originally, the movie was supposed to be a lot smaller. Oh, so that was one of the earliest, that was 2005, Micah. Um, but reshooting everything meant this time it needs to be epic. Uh, so the bridge was no longer just a tiny little uh, crossing, river crossing. It had to be an epic uh, valley bridge. It spans huge. Uh, there was a studio shoot. And from that studio shoot, uh, that is also what you saw, the world in this world. The, the documentary up front from and um, quick snippet from that. That's what they thought in April 2012. Uh, it's eight years and 11 months. So uh, uh, next month, um, the 23rd of next month, uh, will be nine years. Uh, since we were originally location scouting for for Rich, anything anything else you would have would have gotten if you could have or uh, or, or I, don't, I don't I don't know what else we would have got. <laughs> I don't know what else we would have got. I'm happy. I'm very happy. Excellent, great. I, I told you I'm shit into you. Um, I this has been one of the most amicable amicable crews I've I've ever worked with. I think everyone's really friendly and everyone's um, tough team. Um, it's epic. It's the it's, it's the epicest small film ever. I'm very sad because I've thoroughly enjoyed working here for the last few days. 
I've, um, I, I've been working in film for a while and um, I've been on a fair few sets and I don't think I've ever been on one, and this is an absolute truth, but everybody's worked together so well. So yeah, that's when real so production people have all the fun. I was going to say, give, give another two years. Don't say that. You've got to make, that'll give it a 10 don't year. Say, don't say that. Don't, don't, are you recording? Film. Don't, no, don't ten say years. 10 years to death. Edit it in three months. 10 years is about, that is pretty much exactly today. Uh, so this was 10 years ago. We did finish it eight years later. Uh, and part of the reason is because we had a huge to-do list. <laughs> um, there were 142 shots with Micah. And he's a main actor. He is going through the exposition, the funny bits, the comedy, the slapstick, but also enormously elaborate and emotional dialogue. Um, so, And then having his wife and son on screen for only 25 shots still means you got to build and wig and animate and do all that so uh even minor minor effects like the like the uh matte paintings that have to go throughout the whole film uh don't even fit on the screen anymore so let me just start off going through a whole bunch of those the bridge uh, is one of the main characters in the scene, clearly, because uh, the environment sets the mood and all that. Um, this one started out as a concept painting by Svetoslav Petrov, and uh, really phenomenal concepts. Uh, the, and a lot of the times it's been these concepts that we use to draw people into the project, to inspire them. Uh, uh, at some point, we thought we would add ice giants, and because uh, there's a bit of a mentioning in some other books that ice giants previously roamed the the, the Hub Mountains, uh, decided against it eventually. Uh, here was the ultimate, the the final design we ended on, and a lot of inspiration was come was coming from real world uh, locations. Uh, like here is a, I think it's in the Tuscany area. Uh, some of these types of bridges and for the type of masonry, the stonework, we pick something that has like history and feels like it. And then uh, Brian Baxter was actually the main artist building out that bridge to uh, the point where he sketched it out, added all those details that uh, or like indicators of what could be history. Uh, sculpted the whole thing out in ZBrush, and it was ultimately said that it would have five towers. Uh, the first tower would be the gate tower where we come in, then our chairs. Um, then we get the guard tower, uh, which would be coming right after, and then a central tower, which would be the largest. And each of those needed sort of a different style, different types of breakup. Uh, just to have a little bit of variation. Um, the, the main one, the front one, is actually the one that needs to connect to the real set. Uh, and the actual test was this picture where you'd have the, the actual practical on stage built right here and everything outside would be the CG extension. Um, so this was the first picture where we're like, okay, this is going to work. Uh, we can run with this. Uh, it's not quite as detailed yet. You see Neonos, there's some icicles here that are not here yet. So, uh, But it's definitely on the way. More concerning was that the bridge looked empty. If you have a bridge that spans half a kilometer, you need to put stuff on it. Uh, so a whole bunch of people jumped in and helped. Uh, building cards and then wrecking them right away. <laughs> uh, just to give it the whole backstory. Um, 
building material. It has been repaired a million times over from stuff you find as a bridge troll, um, found materials. Eventually we needed even more resolution. That was right around the time when mega scans came out. And uh, the first experiments with applying mega scan texture displacement or the mega scan textures as displacement to simple geometry yielded pretty good results. And that was a good path forward to up the bridge to the, well, to the micro level really. Uh, that was ultimately done then in substance. Uh, and now the icicles are common and then all the shading. Uh, there was also one shading pass done in Mari. So first textures were originally collected in Mari and then painted over once more. Um, at that point, uh, I think Richard Holzhausen was one of the main designers that took it forward on this. Uh, we needed chains. We figured it looked, it looked kind of unstructured here. Couldn't really tell that these towers are individual towers. So we added way more detail with chains, even brought in structural engineering, uh, who explained to us that as it's not a suspension bridge, it technically doesn't need chains, but a lot of other bridges have them too, uh, but they would be used to kind of pull instead of push somehow. Uh, so he recommended having counterweights. And so we built all these mechanisms actually out <laughs> um, just so we could wreck them and then play with different impromptu uh, reparations on that whole thing. So yeah. That's kind of how the bridge eventually came together. Ultimately, the only place that we actually really needed was the first segment between the entrance tower and the first guard tower. Uh, because they never actually go further. That's the only place where the action is taking place. Um, and so that section got an extra detail build out for the whole path where Micah comes up and where his actual motion would happen. Let me just pop through them a little quicker now. <laughs> um, here's that bridge extension, how it comes together in the opening in the first chart. Sorry for my bad crane <laughs> right there. Um, so that was the nuke composite on this. And clearly a lot of it needs to be hidden obviously always. Uh, and here's the extra high res uh, area where we planned out where Micah can climb up that, uh, that um, pillar, uh, come out of his little hiding place. And so we figured this would be a trodden path, but a vertical trodden path. And uh, yeah, uh, to paint actual, geometry and normal maps on, uh, to, you, you can actually use Substance Painter to do normal maps on geometry that is displaced, but you have to bake it out first, at least at that stage, it was the case. But the maps that would be generated would go back into Modo onto the unfrozen model and would actually generate, end up looking like this uh, in the render. So. That was pretty cool how we could round trip this there and add more detail that looks sculpted, but is actually just painted. Um, eventually, we had enough bridge that we could even do full 3D camera moves. So in some shots, not much of that plate was really left, uh, quite frankly. Um, yeah, you can see. Even the horse had to be kind of cobbled together there uh, from a different shot for performance reasons. But ultimately that bridge ends up appearing in pretty much every shot um, because there was only a small piece of real bridge actually built. You see the plate pretty much always cuts out right there. Um, and so most of it is bridge and of course matte paintings. 
the entire background, probably 70% of pixels you see on screen are matte painting. Um, and they were all done by Dave Tipper, uh, a god among, a god walking the earth. Uh, he walks out of a shed in New Zealand. So I guess he's got the best reference right outside his min window. Um, absolutely epic. Most of the time you just ask them for something and next day comes the next masterpiece. <laughs> um, absolute killer. He also ended up creating a lot of it, like these clouds, for example. The, the nice thing was that he was already working in Nuke. And so he wasn't delivering his matte paintings just as an image, but as Nuke composite. So you would actually have the full 3D individual layers. And this was reprojected onto geometry. And so, uh, and even the clouds were their own little system in the 2.5D nuke space, which meant everything was actually handling, we were actually just shoving very small files around each other, to each other, uh, fairly small nuke comps to make adjustments. Um, Originally, we had thought we'd needed a full 3D mountain around, but it turns out it wasn't actually even necessary. So the, the 2D approach meant we had a lot more detail, um, or 2.5D, and it also merged itself better in with extra footage for the foreground clouds and different better layering this way. Uh, here's another very sweet, the long shot. This was, yeah, probably one of my favorites. And this is all CG bridge in this case, straight off Modo. Pretty cool, huh? Uh, I'm gonna keep talking quickly, because I still got Mike, I haven't even talked about the main character yet. <laughs> uh, this was actually a bit of a modo experiment. Um, Micah originally, it was the first test animation. The idea was to sort of roto animate. Make us the name. You don't know what an honor this is. And basically set keyframes right over Make the Make us the name. You don't know what an honor this is. This was the first time, this was the first test where we were like, okay, this might actually work without mocap. Um, except my it's still a lot of work. I always thinking about his huge bloody wooden bridge. <laughs> That's all my wife ever talks about. <laughs> so it was straight off uh, Daniel's performances. Um, 2005, once again, it's extremely clear that this would not hold up today or even probably in 2005, to be honest. Uh, so after the reboot of the project and after the 2013, that's when Post was really starting anew. So Micah got a complete facelift in Modo this time. Uh, originally he was started in Lightwave, now migrated to Modo, back to the drawing board, getting new reference in, uh, making sure he's no longer naked, for example. Uh, that had bothered me the whole time. Um, and also giving those, at that time, the sculpting tools were fairly new in Modo, and so really gave him a new detailed brush over. Ah, really in the way here. So before the old and the new, and really getting all the craggly cracks, and this is all sculpted with the multi-res sculpt straight in Modo. Uh, Pretty convenient, actually, how it has these ZBrush-like shaders, which wouldn't you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to tell that it's not ZBrush. It feels like ZBrush, quacks like ZBrush, uh, maybe not quite as fast and whatnot, but the, the the you get the time back because you never have to export. You can just you can just hop into sculpting, uh, hop into texturing, actually. He was, also, he was also texture painted right in Modo. Um, so classic UV. And then just taking a little piece of rock 
that I found that I liked and just kind of brushing them on and basically sculpting out every single one of those plates, uh, painting them out. And so it was a pretty elaborate process actually. Uh, but again, without ever actually changing software, painting straight in Modo. Um, has the convenience that you can do your look design, your shader design, uh, right away you can get your <coughs> test renders done, which are not some, which are the actual render engine that you're gonna end up working with. Um, ultimately the whole thing was then baked down. So uh, I think my laptop's really in the way here. What it says down there on the bottom is that the original sculpt was having 15 million polys with their sub pixel displacement. Uh, and the one that was then baked down to uh, is a vector displacement map. Yeah. Oh, shit. I'm just going to tear everything apart. I can't. So with a vector displacement map, it was only 15,000 polys. Oops. Hang on, let me prepare this quickly. Um, the rigging was also done straight in Modo, actually. So uh, we used uh, the phenomenal auto character setup from Lucas Acera for this. In fact, we were working very closely in collaboration with him. And he even helped me build the face rig in a way that integrates into ACS. So poses and everything would be working on the face. Uh, the face rig itself is a fairly complicated matter. Here's the best book I can recommend. Uh, this is what I use to build the face rig out. The Art of Moving Points by um, Brian Tyndall. It's an ebook, actually interactive. Highly recommend. Uh, this is a cluster-based animation. So the idea is that you define these point clusters and you would use deformers in a particular order of operation to simulate the sliding skin across all dimensions. So it's point clusters that slide over uh, the geometry. Meaning in Modo itself, this is then implemented as a lot of spline uh, deformers. Um, rigged up in a, an enormous noodle salad. <laughs> uh, but all the actual controllers themselves gotten rigged into uh, ACS. So you would have, this was the first face test where can he be angry? Can he be funny? Can he be smirky? Um, we found out at that point we were still kind of designing look like we have eyebrows or no eyebrows. Um, I think we decided on shaving them because it was kind of interfering. Uh, and the, the finished version of the rig ended up having pretty much all these controllers and all these deformers sort of hidden underneath. And you just have these very simple, um, pretty much pretty simple system of main controls, which would be these blocks. And each of those is broken down into three sub controls, which you could use for final uh, adjustments. But whatever you do on those would always be made into like some sort of automatically picking the direction where would the skin cluster slide and how would they bend. Um, it looks a lot softer in this uh, geometry style than before the trends because the displacement ultimately is what gives it the whole look. And even animation we did in Modo, which wasn't that easy because you can't really find Modo animators. This is not a job that exists so much. Everybody's a Maya animator. <laughs> um, so the first thing was setting up documentation. Uh, to get this whole thing done, we had a bootcamp uh, website that had detailed tutorials, not only on like pretty much all these instructional, what is this rig? How does Modo work? Uh, very much in 10 lessons broken down. So any animator could come in and say, uh, and, and jump in. Uh, 
they would find out how the because keyframe is keyframe. If you know where what the graph editor looks like, and just kind of explain them to people. And a lot of animators actually said they liked Modo now better because suddenly once they especially with the ACS4, uh, once you know what's what's where, uh, it's super easy. Um, here's a classic character sheet. Um, kind of sort of just as a reminder for animators, uh, what would be the default stance uh, so it, that they don't bring him too straight, straighten him out too much. Uh, yeah. <coughs> just to keep him in character for the most of the time. So things that animators would repeatedly do, like get him lifted up so his feet go straight, which is not in the character. He needs to be much more bulky and always heavy. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, for animators, we also had these extra pickers. And one of my favorite inventions is the uh, is the face picker here. So the body picker for picking the body parts, but the face picker wasn't just picking, it also had quick lip sync controls where these uh, joystick style controls down there, they would already encapsulate full mouth movements into the A. Uh, so up, down go makes the mouth from A to M, that transition, and the left, right goes E to O. And just with this one uh, joystick, you can already do a rough lip sync. Uh, and so, yeah, that was one of the things. Another thing we found out was that since every animator was working from their own home, from their own house, we actually set up the scene in different versions. So there is a, a light version that people can run on a laptop that still gives you decent frame rate. Uh, that just a lot of this stuff is turned off. The textures aren't even loaded. Uh, then there's the regular version for people with a desktop. And if anybody has a gaming machine, they can feel free to take the full version. Um, we ended up animating on this for so long that we are, normally you would freeze the software version, but for us, that was not even an option because the Modo team was really helpful in using Mica as a benchmark tool and the uh, overly complicated rig is like a worst case scenario. And a lot of the features you might've noticed things like animation caching, uh, they really help a lot with animation. Uh, I think we started in Modo 5, I would say. I know for a fact that we started with 3.5 frames per second as a frame rate. Uh, and in the end, it was 60 frames per second. Same rate, just Modo becoming faster and faster and faster. Uh, getting more optimized. So complete breeze. Um, ironically, the final mica that you see in the film is actually just this geometry. Very, very few polygons. In fact, these are the animated polygons. These are the ones in the rig. All the rest of the detail comes from the vector displacement map, which is a little better than displacement maps because Vector displacement can really do move points sideways. That's how you get these overhangs and really crack, cracks that are detailed enough to go deep and still have detail on the sides. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much Micah um, in a nutshell. Yeah. Uh, the horse, for example, um, this was another wonderful collaboration. Uh, it was sculpted by Dimitri Leppe. He came into this project as a fan and he built the horse from the inside out. He like started right there from the ground. Um, muscles uh, uh, actually gave measurements because to measure it against the live action horse that we had. Um, even the furnishing on the, on the saddle of the horse was all modeled out. And we had two versions of the horse, actually. One is the full body version. This was used for all the white shots, uh, all the helicopter shots when he's walking through the snow. And so this one needed all the saddle, all the furnishing. 
eventually we ended up putting this horse on the bridge as well for some of those extra camera movement shots. Um, UVs, obviously, um, ended up getting a groom artist, a really good one, Cameron Christian. Really terrible. I'm sitting right over the credits. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but even at the end, the big challenge was still to get it actually integrated. What took you so long? And so, yeah, and animated. So this was also the part where some people that came into the project kind of just from interest ended up becoming supervisor. Uh, for example, Marta, she originally is just signed up to animate Micah and she did just a, such a phenomenal job, such cute animations um, that when the horse was ready and to animate, uh, she said she has horses around her. She lives in, in the country and she loves horses too. So she became the most, uh, I mean, such an incredible supervisor that I wasn't even hands on on the horse at all. She was giving people amazing instructions, really going deep, getting extra photos of exactly the horse movements that she needed, the horse mouths. So absolute phenomenal. This is kind of the, this was the type of volunteer engagement where people coming in and then growing in the project and sort of using it as a way to grow themselves. Um, and having like this, this space where you can, where nobody restricts you because anybody could take on any role if they feel like they can do it and they can do it. We had texture painters that finally wanted to animate. We had tech artists that finally want, that were too long out of lighting and wanted to do something creative again. Uh, we had people straight out of school that wanted to have something for their reel. We had people that were doing commercial animation all day long and wanted to do something cute. That's not just hardware or devices. Um, so, so yeah, uh, one last, on, this is probably the shot I'm, I like the most. Uh, Nuke was used in compositing, obviously, and compositing alone, each single shot had a million challenges um, with the beard, with so many things. Um, and yeah, ultimately, I'm just kind of glad it came together the way it did. All right, I would leave it there, I guess. <laughs> Um, so what, what role did Foundry play in this, uh, in this production? Oh, Foundry. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't even mention Foundry was our it's main fun. sponsor. Oh my God. Thank you guys so much for making this possible. Um, <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, it, it was, uh, nobody less than Brad Peebler put his personal support behind it. Uh, he did a modcast from his Prius, um, <laughs> was telling everybody to join the project and, this is actually when a lot of artists came flocking and um, the fact that we had access to Foundry software, Foundry licenses, uh, that was another wonderful way to put this project onto, uh, onto legitimate stands. Um, so thank you so much. No, no, cool. uh, yeah, just yeah, just curious. Yeah, so you used Modo and you used Nuke, and uh, those Modo, are the primary tools. Nuke, yeah. Pretty much every software under the planet, but it turned out Modo was yeah, right. most versatile in terms of rendering on an online farm. Uh, our secondary right. sponsor was Garage Farm. Uh, highly recommend. They are very very cheap. Yes, I can say cheap. It's not a bad word in this case. <laughs> They're really no. really cheap, uh, and with Modo, you get unlimited render node licenses on any farm. That's the big, one big selling point. Um, if you're doing compositing on top of it anyways, nobody will know what you render stuff in. Uh, so, yeah. Well, it's well enough done. We had much bigger like problems with the horse, which was done in Arnold, which was a nightmare licensing wise, or even just having somebody test it or finding somebody you can jade it or whatnot. So uh, the bridge was not 100% in Modo. Uh, we had friends at high places. Uh, uh, the tech guy, a, a 
uh, uh, Bjorn Siegert from Weather. He's actually one of the in-house tech guys. Uh, he's a huge moto head too. Uh, and he wanted to get into creative stuff again. So he lit the bridge. He figured all the horse render stuff out. Uh, and yeah, he was a huge help too. And when you get a guy at Weather working on your film and then people come and see what he's doing, all of a sudden you have an animator at Weather do a camera move, you know, just because they're like, oh, that's cool. Uh, let me do a camera move for that spider. So what you saw in the beginning in the opening, that was not even my camera move. That was from a Weather animator. Um, I, that, that experience alone must have been uh, just extraordinarily exciting to see as it comes together. Um, uh, do you have, uh, we, we were starting to get some questions in, and there's one here that, uh, I, no I noticed from Arvid Walborg. Uh, mm -hmm. so this project already had, this is an interesting question. Um, so this project already had a work from home situation. How would you compare this project to current world situation and being done at home instead of at a, uh, facility building? We had a lot of the same challenges. Uh, one challenge is that when everybody's from home, everybody relies on their own machine, on their home software. You cannot actually, uh, you suddenly have to figure out ways how to share files that are not gigabytes, but just kilobytes uh, to do things. So for example, you gotta be organized. So we used Shotgun, that was our third main sponsor. Uh, not Autodesk. Eventually, we got grandfathered into Autodesk, but we actually were on the shotgun side. Shotgun was our sponsor officially. <laughs> and so something like this, like an organizational tool like that is extremely helpful. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Shotgun. It allows you to post your work, uh, but not just the clip. We also made it mandatory that you actually at append the source file. So if you post a composite, you have to also append your nuke comp, your nuke script. Um, if you make an animation, you also have to append, uh, uh, attach the animation file. And so the, the good thing is that nuke scripts are tiny. With uh, Micah, uh, with the ACS4, all the animations aren't even full modo scenes. They are literally just tiny animation snippets that you drag in. And so, uh, yeah, this collaborative file sharing is important. The other thing is you have to have a place where you can meet and gather. So I had daily meetings on Skype with the director and the producer and also pulled in individual animators when they had questions or asked or requests or stuff like that. So, Having a regular schedule where you can coordinate and meet virtually and having a good file sharing system in place. We also had Dropbox, uh, yeah. a three terabyte business account. <laughs> um, so. All right. I think I'll take the next one on this, Greg, if you don't mind. I'm just going based off the number of upvotes. So if there's a question in the questions that you see, upvote it and they'll come to the top of this and we'll be sure to make sure those get answered. So this one's from James Atkinson. He asks, uh, what was used for the hair and fur and how was it integrated into the project? Um, I mean, it depends. The, the hair on the horse was done in Yeti, which I'm honestly, it was not really integrated into a project. It was always a pain in the ass and kind of running as its own side stream. Uh, it had its own tech, uh, almost like almost its own tech division that needed to solve how that's come. On Micah, he is a hairy guy himself as well. Uh, and all his hair, all his moss and all that, that is straight moto, straight out of moto, right where it is. Um, Sorry. Right. Even the fuzziness on the shoulder pad and everything. So, so Michael was Moto, and then uh, the horse was Yeti. You mentioned and the horse was Yeti and Arnold. Okay, Yeti and Arnold, which is a particular toxic combination because there's only one build of Yeti and one build of Arnold that work together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, 
None of this has happened in Modo because you don't need a plugin and it just works. That's why it's a lot simple there. Very, very cool. Um, what, when, there's another question here from, uh, let's see, actually I should probably check and see what's been upvoted. Uh, okay, uh, DJ asked, answered that one already. And Philip Thater, uh, what was the key problem in mixing it together, lighting? Do you make HDR environment maps on your own? Um, this is kind of a leading question here. Right, uh, actually uh, I do make, H I mean, I'm known for many things. I'm also known for writing the HDRI handbook. Uh, and one of my jobs is right now that I'm a panel professor and teach people how to do HDRIs at Noman uh, School of Visual Effects. So I also ran or run HDRlabs.com, so might bring that back. I honestly don't really quite know, like after you finish a project like this, you're kind of a little bit hanging in the air and then comes a pandemic and then you're like, I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, how those go. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because I mean, it, it, again, I've been using your stuff. Uh, when, when I was in production, I was using your HDRs all the time um, because they were the highest quality HDRs that were available. And then of course we incorporated uh, a selection of those HDRs um, into our content. And so if you guys and go and take a look at our HDRs in the content browser, um, uh, you'll actually see a whole bunch of, of uh, Christian's HDRs in there. So yeah, check out the inside civil of your apartment. Prepared specifically <laughs> to give uh, a little bit of, you know what? Now we're talking about. I'm probably gonna have to update this for our next model version. That hey, we we would that, uh, yes we will. That sounds absolutely fantastic. My favorite, I think, like I told you last time, is the helipad golden hour. Anytime I need to just show an image of of anything really quickly and easily and have decent lighting on it, that's my go-to. That's my favorite. Too. Yeah, yeah. The, the colors are great. Down. Yeah, the saturation is just perfect. And so yeah, and and if you, by the way, anybody who goes and looks at uh, the helipad um, ones, if you swing the HDR around, you will see Christian in one of those HDRs, I believe. <laughs> it's uh, so kind of a it. little. I also yeah, have a little new thing. process actually for 32K HDRs. Um, so at that point, you can actually like set your camera to a hundred millimeter and just film. Uh, wow. Yeah. And actually, if you, if you take a look at, the, at those HDR environments too, you'll see uh, one of the more efficient ways of setting up an environment properly uh, because it's split apart into multiple different images. You know, there is a spherical backdrop one that's just a JPEG and then there's one that's re for reflections that's low resolution and then our, yeah. And then a, or high resolution. Then there's a low resolution one just for the diffuse lighting. And so it's a, definitely a smarter way of, of setting up an environment and you can kind of just learn something just by, you know, opening up those, uh, those presets that are in the content browser. And uh, DJ, do you have uh, any other questions? Oh, we'll ask one by Luis Godinez. Um, so how was the rendering experience inside of Moto? How was the rendering experience? Yeah. Uh, like what, how did that question. go in any issue? I mean, it renders. <laughs> what, yeah. is the, what experience do you have? What's the, I normally don't watch renders. Uh, uh, did the preview renderer, for instance, did that help you out at all um, with, with rendering in Moto? It does, I guess. I mean, it works. It's <laughs> there is, like, I don't even know uh, what's your experience opening a door. It just doesn't. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Uh, well, so you your priority is solid, solid. Yeah. Yeah. has a lot of problems of like, oh, incompatibilities and this and that, uh, or I cannot render this particular type of geometry because it comes from this or that. You don't have these problems in motor because it's built in, it's right there. It's it, everything works with that render engine. If you want to bake something, it bakes exactly the same way because it shoots the same ways that it would normally use to render. And so, um, <laughs> I find it bizarre that other software does not have a built-in render engine and this entire third party market has even had to be had to be developed. Like there wouldn't be render engines if Maya could render. 
Yeah, yeah, that's actually that is a, a good point. <laughs> I mean, uh, well, I mean, it's always, it's always the big question of like that's the whole that's the whole core purpose of the software. Um, what I do find interesting is that Modo is so easily accepted in online render farms, and that and and for some reason it renders faster on the farm even than expected. So pff, honestly, these bridge shots that you saw. On average, one shot of the bridge itself came about five dollars in render cost. It's nothing. That's wow. Like, wow, wow, wow. This is ridiculous cheap. Uh, and we have a we have a new render that was the default legacy render, which is still in Modo. Um, the shaders have gone through a lot of updates over the past couple of years because we have multiple different shading models that are supported in the default render. Uh, but we do have a new render empath, which is uh, you know is physically based and uh, it's a it's a path tracer that is uh, basically the new iteration that you're going to continue to see develop further and further uh, on. Very so, interesting. And it's, it's easier. Uh, yeah. And, and it's this easy. project was going to be sort of something with a lot of bling. And I believe a path tracer is exactly what I need for that uh, to get a there we go. nice chromatic operation -y stuff and some refraction -y stuff going. Um, let's go with one last question here from uh, James Atkinson again. Uh, besides ACS, which you used for rigging, were there any other key add-ons or kits that you used with Modo to help your workflow? Besides, well, ACS is the key. That was the key to unlock the possibility to do it at all. So ACS is necessary for writing out actions, having animations set with another thing having a character rig that is usable, that you can easy control and flip in and out of different. And so it's a, because it's not just a rigging system, it's an animation system as well. And part of it was because we worked with Lucas. He always asked, what are your problems? What can you not do? And then he just did it. So there was, what other add-ons did we have on Modo? None, actually really none. ACS awesome. was the one add-on we needed. Uh, the second add-on I have is the garage farm uploader, where you say render and it uploads your scene assets. And it's smart enough to not upload anything that is, has already previously uploaded. So super cool. Awesome, awesome. All right, very cool. And I, I guess I lied. That, that is a the lot last of question. new add-ons. Uh, oh, okay. New, you would definitely need a lot of the compositing tricks here were necessary to have. Uh, world map uh, extraction. Uh, so I don't know what it was called. Uh, RGBZ world map, uh, world coordinate extractor or something. Um, so that was pretty critical. We also had Houdini in use heavily for the sword effect. Uh, that was like its own problematic thing where multi-layered where it's a multi-layered uh actually in a, yeah just coming up with a system that can both react to all the motion and then you have to track the sword so just that one effect alone which is completely minor in the scope of the whole thing uh was a lot of trouble to set up and ended up being a shitload of individual elements that only come together in the comp. So you have a sparkly component, a smoky component. Yeah, very cool. So magic isn't done <laughs> so easy. <laughs> yeah, that's why you need nuke right there. Got to pull all this stuff together and make it pretty. Really. That's, that was the big problem. Sure, yeah. absolutely. Uh, Thank you so much for putting this together. Uh, I know this was not a small challenge to present all this because, guys, there's a lot of extra information that we couldn't cram inside this time. Check out his website. There's all the, or the like the his website, but also Snowgun Films, I believe. Right? Is that correct? Yeah, Trollbridge.film. Mm -hmm. That URL there. That's where you see a lot more making off, a lot more behind the scenes. You can see the full film in the best quality. Uh, still watch it on YouTube to give it some plays. But otherwise, <laughs> um, 
yeah, this is a lot more making of. And all the credits, all the people that I forgot to mention, all 300 are right there. Perfect. Exactly. And if you haven't watched the film, check it out. Um, you are going to be very, very pleasantly surprised with your, your investment of 30 minutes. It's fantastic and it is well worth uh, taking a watch. So thank you again for doing this for us, Christian. This has been fantastic. Thank you this one quote. There we go. Okay. There are times in life when people must know when not to let go. Balloons are designed to teach small children this.